biggest thing that he did that probably hurt more than anything else that Mick ever did to me is he ended up, you know, slamming me or running me into the steps and dropping the elbow off of the apron onto the concrete. That was pretty snug, but, you know, he took a lot more than he dished out. Mark, you've said this before. So I'll say it now. We may be a glutton for punishment at this point. Oh, we're definitely a glutton. <laughs> oh, well, no. There, there is no... Continuing maybe. to do this and continuing to come back uh, week after week. Oh, we're sadists. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a fetish. It really is. But, but the great thing is, Mark, uh, there's people that believe in us. My mom's. I don't know if my mom even knows that I do this. No, oh, really? Yeah, my mom definitely. <laughs> you know what? I don't, I don't know who I'm kidding. My mom definitely does not know. <laughs> uh, my mom doesn't know who The Undertaker is. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, put really? that out there. Your mom? More than likely not. I don't know. She probably does. I mean, she, uh, I mean, she grew up in a house where yeah, wrestling was definitely uh, on all the time. And... Uh, my nephew, who is 23 now, mm -hmm. was uh, a big fan of wrestling, and he spent a lot of time over at my parents' house, you know, hanging out or whatever. My sister lived right down the street. So um, I would imagine that, you know, if I said The Undertaker, she'd be. You mean you're not talking about me when you're over there? I, here's the deal. What? With my mom... Um, it's my mom cares a lot about me, mm -hmm. but she's really, uh, she's really not invested in what I do when it comes to podcasting. <laughs> when it right. comes to my, her, her number one concern is, have you gone to church? <laughs> like, oh, well, no, that's yeah. good. That, that's Second good. thing is, is, uh, you taking care of your wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything else after that, she's just like, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't she's matter. a good Old Testament woman. <laughs> yeah, she's an Old Testament woman. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's uh, my mom definitely. Yeah, we've got fans. Uh, our moms are fans of us. Oh, yeah, but I don't know if my mom knows how to even operate YouTube. So, yeah, mine definitely does not. No, yeah, yeah. and so, but we do have fans, and uh, one of which uh, decided they wanted to actually uh, uh, sponsor the show in prize picks. Prize picks, they. Man, they stepped up, brother. You know what I told? We, this is, we told them the other day. I was like, we can make this the Prize Picks Studio. I mean, this could go. We could get we could get wild with this if we wanted oh, yeah. to. And uh, I think I I enjoy sports enough to where I'm all in with Prize Picks. Yeah, I was sold. You know what? Once I I downloaded the app. And then I saw how one, how easy it was. Yeah. And then two, what it was, <laughs> right? Just was, more I, or less. I, just I, got, I got nervous. <laughs> I got nervous. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. I can, I could actually spend a lot of money here. <laughs> and have fun with and, it. And, and have fun. And, yeah. and, it went, and the way that it's laid out, like trying to figure out that, that initial, the initial, um, you know the the initial deal that we did. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, I could, I could totally. This is the this is right here is safe. <laughs> this this is money in my pocket. And this had a click on it, man. Yeah, it, it's I fun. Love it I it love is. It. It, 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 it is a lot of fun. Well, Price Picks is the best way to get action on sports in more than thirty states across the country, including California, the great state of Texas, state of Texas. and Florida. Uh, testing my skills on Price Picks. Um, is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Hey, scared money don't make money. That's right. Buddy. That's right. It is the easiest That's app funny. to use, even for a guy like The Undertaker. Wait, wait a minute. Hey, download the app today and use code 6FEET for a first deposit match of up to $100. So if you put in 100 bucks. Price Picks is going to give you $100. Download the app today and use the code 6FEET for a first deposit match up to $100.
I just want to say, yeah, because we started with prize picks during the uh, championship weekend, mm -hmm. the AFC NFC championships. I have never been more invested <laughs> in two games. games that I could care <laughs> about <laughs> than I was that day because of of, of my three picks that I had uh, with prize picks. Yeah, they make it fun. It really yeah. is a it's a fun app and. Um, it's, I mean, I think on, uh, a, a lot of them, it's like, you can do like five bucks yeah. and you're just picking more or less. It's like, they'll have things where, uh, it's Steph Curry, he's going to hit seven threes tonight or right. something like that. Right. Like pick more or less, more or less. Yeah. And it's, it, it is a lot of fun. And I caught myself the other night watching a basketball game and, uh, an NBA game. And I'm a, I like college basketball, but right. my game cogs are doing well, yeah. but NBA, I like watching the playoffs yeah. and I like watching the finals. Right. But I don't watch a lot of regular season NBA. Yeah. And, uh, I will say that prize picks, uh, has me <laughs> watching watch yeah, yeah, yeah. regular season. And then NBA. I didn't realize there's a lot of guys at, at work that, are on prize picks as well. They didn't smarten us up. Did they, they didn't. They didn't let us know about this. So um, we appreciate everyone over there at Prize Picks. Uh, I, I remember that I had it. My, I had it on in my dressing room because I had a one dead man show that night. <laughs> and normally I don't have the TV on at all. I'm, I'm thinking about you know what I want to talk about. Yeah. And everything else and like it became like a big deal. Like I said, hey, I need this TV <laughs> on to figure out. And then I would go out, like I did sound check and all this other stuff. I'm like coming back, why? I'm like, show the stats, show the stats. <laughs> so he's looking at me like I got six heads. Like, yeah. Oh, I need to know how many yards Lamar Jackson. Did you had. also um, have you looked on there? I don't know how much you, you, you've been playing with it, uh, but they also have the analytics of like their last like five games, their last like it will show you. Also, like I didn't even get into all that. Yeah. So, like, uh, oh man, I'm yeah. I'm, oh, you're in deep. I'm in deep. I'm I'm enjoying it. So you you can click on it's essentially you know the square and you can choose that square. So let's say the square is um, we'll use Steph Curry again. Steph Curry to score you know thirty points tonight or something. Right. So it will show like his last five games. What he's trending. How what he's, he's trending. trending. Yeah. You know, maybe uh -huh. he's averaging twenty eight. Maybe he's been averaging 35 or whatever. And so right. it's like, and, and oh man, and this is where it gets fun. So they have um, like these uh, demons and goblins and stuff that are on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. so like the demons are, it's going to be a little bit tougher to, to make that, to make that, yeah, to yeah, get yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but if you hit there, it's like, stupid yeah it's stupid how much your money gets amp yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah amplified so it is uh i don't know it is a, it is a fun app to be a part of and uh it's a fun they're a fun company to be a part of um the funny thing was was uh having a meeting with those guys and and they were like hey if you ever need anything you know, whatever you need just let me know and all this stuff and i was like okay okay and the guy was like um uh, well just um uh, uh, I might be a little slow to respond, and this was a while, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm be a little slow to respond. It's Mardi Gras here in New Orleans, and I was like, "Yeah, we're gonna get along. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get along just fine." I was like, hey, "I was need, like, you need to meet Mark." Yep. I was like, "You got your priorities in order, brother." <laughs> Hell yeah, yeah. No, but no, they're great folks, yeah. um, and we appreciate them supporting the podcast. Uh, also, want to give a shout out real quick before we go into this. First Form, thank you so much, First Form, for sending us a bunch of cool products. Mark, they've sent more protein to you. Yep. Um, got the chocolate. They got the chocolate. Gra grab that right yeah. there. Oh, That's this is the, about it this over it. here. Yeah. This right here is my favorite pre workout ever. Project One. Project One. I'm telling you. Berry lemonade. And it's good. Man, look at that. I, I'm just telling you this right now. If I, if I take this, there is no not working out. Really? Yeah. Or I will drive everyone absolutely bananas because I am ready. I'm charged up, brother. Ready. No. <laughs> I don't have that much Take left. Take it to the dome, baby. I got to wait. I, I got to wait till I need some more of that. But yes, yeah, so, so don't waste. Oh, my God. Oh, that, man. That, that's, that's money in a bucket right there. Well, these guys have been great to us. Uh, Who would have ever thought that 
people would actually pay us. I would have thought they would have paid to get us off of podcast, <laughs> not not to actually make our podcast better. Oh my goodness! Well, I'm going to pull out the computer over here, and if anybody has ever watched our show before uh, over on Patreon, we like to do Q and A with the with the fans. And um, boy, do you have some passionate fans. You know what? That's what fan means. That's right. Fanatic. Fanatics. So, over on our Patreon, uh, you can go to Patreon, look up Six Feet Under with Mark Calloway, and uh, on our, I think it's 10 bucks a month, you can submit Q&A, uh, you can submit questions. Um, we're going to start pulling one random question to kind of air on our episodes, maybe just moving one. forward. Just, just be in about more than one. Sometimes uh, I get into I get into that feel of things. It's yeah, like, okay. and there's a lot of times you'll tell me, Matt, let's just let's just answer a bunch of questions yeah. for fans. Let's just have fun. So um, that means we have no material. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, is uh, that's the got, truth. We got 35 years worth of material. I'm only 40, so and I forgot 20. Yeah, so, we so we're in, I, we need to be able to stretch this thing out, or we're only going to have about a six month podcast. We're going to have a six month run, <laughs> but it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm going to just uh, just randomly pull one. How about that? Give me a favorite. Give me one of my favorites. One of your favorites? Give me a, just one of my favorites. Be somebody that I talk about all the time. Oh, man. Uh, so. Um, let me, I don't, I know you don't want to, <laughs> you know what? Here's a, here's an easy one. Okay. As I, I will, I will scour through these a little bit more. Right. Okay. Give me an easy one. Um, so this one, uh, comes from Steve Lograsso. Steve Lograsso. Steve Lograsso. That name sounds familiar. Really? Okay. Um, how did you wrestle after getting a tattoo? Um, he said he asked, "Did did you have to take a a few weeks off after every tattoo?" Uh, I was about to say, "There's no way," uh, especially in the early days. Uh, oh, and um, uh, also, is there any meanings to any of your tattoos? Well, yeah, I'm a tortured soul. My goodness, <laughs> look at me. Uh, so. Two weeks off, huh? Uh, yeah, negative, Ghost Rider. You got to break something to get two weeks two off. Two weeks off. I'm going to have to break it, like compound fracture break it back to get two weeks off when I was doing tattoos. Um, well, let me just, I'll just run this outside tattoo. This was the first, right? This was uh, kind of based off of my original likeness. Of course, it's, this guy's all jacked up and muscled up, but. This this tattoo was originally supposed to be about this about this high. It was supposed to be maybe what what is that five inches, six that's inches. twelve, right? <laughs> if you do it twice, uh, that's how big that was supposed to be. And okay, we got to the so I worked in Las Vegas. I get picked up by none other. Then the, then the Godfather. This is before he was the Godfather. So, uh, and, and this was, I think this was, this was before his run as Papa Shango. Is this the famous picture? Yeah, the me in the tattoo parlor yeah, with the yeah. hat, black hat on sitting there. Yes. So, very small little tattoo parlor, uh, full of people. But, uh, so the guys, the, the artist's name, it was uh, Smiling Paul. Smiling Paul. Yeah. And so I worked. I worked to Thomas and Mac. Godfather. What before he was Godfather, he was just bare at that point to me. Picks me up outside the loading dock at Thomas and Mac. We go straight. We go straight to the tattoo parlor. Now I was on early because this is, you know, this is 91, I think. Go straight to the tattoo parlor, and we start. And he grinded on my arm 
like the technique through the years has gotten much better, m- much better. The equipment has got much better. Yeah. Um, but so Paul was a, he, I would say he was a little heavy handed mm. and he would, you know, he would drag that needle across my arm and then he had to wipe it. And it was, uh, it was a pretty intense eight hours that I set. Eight hours, eight hours for that one tattoo. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. not an eight-hour tattoo. No, no. But I, I don't know any better. I got, like I said, Paul Bear was, was there for a long time. Bears there. I got numerous Hell's Angels coming in and out. You know, and everybody when you get back and get your first tattoo, you know, everybody wants to see you squirm. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't selling it right. So I'm sitting there being all Joe Cool and everything, and he's just. He's smoking a cigarette. That's why, you know, he's smoking, he's drying, he's grinding. And anyway, eight hours. I got to go back to the hotel and get my bag and go to the airport because I got a double shot the next day. Oh. Yeah. And, and like, I want to say it was, uh, I want to say it was like Chicago and, and um, oh, some town in maybe Indianapolis. I had a double shot. I'm, and I'm program. I'm I'm with the Ultimate Warrior. And so I wake. Well, I never woke up. When I woke up from the on the plane in Chicago, my arm is now starting to swell. I mean, it is, it is huge. And I'm like, holy crap! And it's throbbing and everything else. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, man, I've got some kind of infection. Something going on. Oh. So I get to the arena. And uh, I was like, hey, Jim, I was like, look, I was like, don't worry, it's my right arm. I said, try not to grab it. I mean, look, it's 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 pretty tender. It's pretty blown up. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, no worries. No, 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 no problem at all. You know, now it's my right arm. If you've ever noticed, most times in a wrestling match, the left arm is used for grabbing and pulling, getting up, whatever. It's usually the left arm. Yeah. I bet we weren't in the match 10, 15 seconds, and he just snatches right onto my arm and jerks me. I don't know if he was going to shoot me in or what. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I, 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 I mean, it. I've got a high threshold of pain. That was not one of those moments. I honestly thought, like, my skin had just, like, it had busted open. It was fine. I mean, it got a little scabby, but I mean, it was fine. But it, man, it it hurt. So I, yeah, there was no two weeks. Is that what? Well, do you think that was a rib, or do you think that was? Because uh, uh, he doesn't seem like the type of person that ribs a lot, or d- didn't rib a lot. No, you know no, he wasn't. No, it wasn't. I, I just think that was just the way he was. I mean, he may have been just testing me too. Yeah. But you know, we hadn't been we hadn't been working together that long. Yeah. Um. But yeah, boy, he snatched me up, and, that and I would arm. imagine he's the type of person that when he grabs you, he grabs you too. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. There was yeah, he was, he was, yeah. he was intense, and uh, yeah, that that stung for a few days working with it. But yeah, there was no two weeks off or letting it heal <laughs> or anything else. It was just like, yeah, you did this, dummy. Now you got to, you know, you got to bear the consequences. So now, um, how did you? F- feel like was there any concern that starting to get tattooed and stuff that could have hurt the undertaker's image i feel like if there was ever a character that could get away with tattoos it would be the undertaker's and that that was that was that was my thought but oh lord have mercy vince was pissed yeah oh he was pissed off at me yeah as were my parents but yeah your mom your mom dad didn't know they didn't approve no and uh but vince especially was pissed yeah. Like I show up at TV. So back then, you know, we we toured all month and then we get to TVs and then we would tape like three days in a row. Um, our, 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 we would. Yeah, we would tape our our shows so we could t- continue touring and we'd have our TV shows in the can. Yeah. I remember showing up Vince seeing my arm. Oh, my, he cussed me like a dog 
God damn, why would you do that to yourself? You can't do that. You can't mess with the gimmick without talking to me first. I mean, he went on and on and on and on about it. He hated tattoos. He didn't. Yeah. yeah he didn't I mean, like now, if there was one, but if there's one character, they could get away with it. Right? Well, I you know, was... so I did the, so my whole outside arm, now all this, nothing, none of this is done. None of that's done. None of this is all that's yeah. done. And he's like, no more tattoos, right? I'd already decided in my head that I was gonna, sl I was gonna get my sleeves done, right? Yeah. And uh, I was like, well, so it healed finally, and then I was like, it's the inside. He'll never notice the inside. <laughs> so I got the inside done, and he didn't. He didn't notice. And then the oh, next, really? no, no, no. And then the next thing I started. So the guy that started this forearm was Smiling Paul's brother. So he started on this side, and then by then, you know, Vince kind of just. He gave up. Got, yeah, he gave up, he gave up, up on point. it, and then now I, I, I don't think the Undertaker would have been the same. I don't. I, no. I think the tattoos were part of the the mystique, especially going over to the ABA. I mean, once you became yeah. the American badass, oh yeah, I mean, it definitely the biker yeah. look and feel. You gotta yeah, all that fit. But even with the even with the original Dead Man character, it was just I think you know I just added to it to yeah so. Yeah, there's was, uh, there's one obvious tattoo that you definitely regretted, but is there any other ones that you regretted? Why you? Why do you I just I, I I I just wanted to go ahead and say that one. We definitely is the number one. But is there any other tattoos that you've regretted? That regret? Um, you know what? I, I there there's some of this stuff in here that I, is not real good. Uh, just I wanted to get tattooed. So like, you just like, we, yeah, I just went and, and, and cause you can see it's not really finished, but I wanted to get tattooed. I wanted my sleeves done. So I just went like locally to some, some guy in, uh, in Nashville, mm. you know, I said, Hey, I want this guy coming out of the grave. And then there was this, this spot and it, it was supposed to look like, like a hand coming out of the skin. And I was so, you know, I, I was so unhappy with it. I just never went back and then it just kind of lost importance to uh <laughs> like you know it's not that important to me anymore but anymore uh in the future yeah so i want to get i, I want to get all my my children uh put on me at some point yeah um, which is really past due especially my son i mean he should have been first uh so yeah i've got i've got at least three tattoos to to, to do <laughs> um but uh yeah, I, I don't have like like Michelle and Kaya. They went and um, like Kaya got her ears pierced. Yeah, and a child like I don't know how she was three, maybe younger than that. She got her ears pierced. Yeah, she was younger than that. And then she just ripped them out. She pulled them out like she. So she had little lobster claws. <laughs> Never cried, everything, but she pulled them out. So then, you know, she got older, we had to wait, and then we yeah. got them sewed up, and then we just recently went and got them re-pierced, but we went to the tattoo shop so they could do it with a needle. Yeah. So it would be, you know. So I was in the, that was the first time I'd been in a tattoo parlor in a while. A little bit of an itch. I got a little bit of an itch, but, yeah. the, you know, it was like, you know, I was watching people, I was like, dang, they're really, really good now. Like this. Yeah, oh, it's a. Uh, yeah. It's an art form, yeah. More than anything, yeah, I was like, "Wow, they are good and they are fast." And I was like, <sighs> "Do you kind of wish that uh, it was a little bit of an etch a sketch? You could erase everything and go in like today to yeah, these well, artists now." Oh and... yeah, oh yeah, there, yeah, well, yeah. That's because I mean, you look at the work, like you were saying. Yeah, it's... I mean, we did. We this is, these are over thirty years old. So, yeah, yeah. The, the the equipment and the and the skill. Um, is I mean they're these guys yeah they they there there are a lot of people that are legitimate artists that switch over and do tattoos, tattoos yeah. yeah so all right well um we'll talk a little bit of wrestling here um what wrestling the Luc Lucretia Lucretia Ratley L U C R E T I A exactly yeah Ratley. Miss Ratley, I'm gonna Miss Ratley. Yeah. Um would you please expound on the storyline involving you, Jake the Snake, one of my favorites, Macho Man, and Miss Elizabeth in your baby face turn. Yeah. 
what was it like working with them? That's a six podcast wow, right there. Wow. <laughs> and who decided to turn you a uh, baby face and uh, was <laughs> And was Macho Man really that controlling? <laughs> okay, where do I start? Uh, there's a lot of pieces to that. So, yeah, so, uh, the storyline between you, Jake, the Snake, okay, and Macho. So, the re- well, I guess we'll start with the reason why I turned. The, the, I was already turning. Uh, the the fans were already turning me. It was a natural. Yeah, it was a, it was a natural turn. They were... Uh, I mean, you could go back to uh, Survivor Series in um, in '91, and you can hear even in the, in the match with Hogan, you can hear the the cheers. And so it was it was naturally happening on its own. So they needed a way to get me away from from Jake, who Jake, you know, had, I mean, him and Randy were, you know, they were all they were all tied up in an angle, so. Um, so Macho Man and Miss Elizabeth were going to get married in Madison Square Garden. Um, and, you know, Jake being the sinister, evil cat that he was, was just going to smash them as they came back through the curtain, um, with, with the chair, uh, ruin their, their day and ruin all that. And so Jake's standing there in the curtain and I'm behind Jake and, as Miss Elizabeth gets ready to walk through the curtain, he starts to swing. I grab the chair. I save the day, and your baby face is is born. It's sealed. Right yeah, and then naturally I peel off with the Jake at that point, and um, uh, you know, and we end up going to WrestleMania. Uh, uh, well, it was ninety two WrestleMania ninety two. Um, with Jake, um, that was in Indianapolis, but, uh, so yeah, it was just, it was a transition from, um, uh, you know, Jake and Randy working, uh, turning me, just giving me the, the anointment of, of, of being a baby face character. And, um, but it was, uh, yeah, the, the 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 reason I mean, obviously, yeah, the reason was behind it was just because I was turning naturally. Were you excited to um, to work with Jake? Oh yeah, man. It, 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 so I was already traveling with Jake, and the amount of knowledge of the business and why he did things and how he did things, I learned so much just traveling with him. Not to mention, you know, all the bad stuff that I learned. <laughs> you learned him. a lot of other things. I learned a lot of bad <laughs> habits from Jake. Uh, but man, the 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 knowledge that he spit traveling, you know, us up and down the road. Yeah. Uh, wow, man, he was uh, honestly a, a a wrestling genius. Uh, in, in the in the everything that he did, he was the one that taught taught me to carry a little pocket recorder with me he says because you're going to hear things like in songs that you that are, are going to click with you and you gotta and you gotta write it you gotta put it in there because you won't remember it yeah I, especially traveling with him i wouldn't remember it because there's a good <laughs> chance that i wouldn't remember where i was at the night before but that or sometimes you'd be thinking about a promo and you would hit a line or something you would come up with so he always had that that little recorder with him that he would you know, he would put his thoughts on. Um, so I, I got that from him. Um, yeah, he was the one that taught me. He goes, your match starts as soon as you walk through that curtain. Doesn't start at ding, ding, ding. The match starts as soon as you come out of gorilla position. It's just, I mean. And you figured that out probably better than anybody. Oh, your, yeah. I mean. Oh, yeah. Your entrance was. By the time I got to the ring, my match was half over. Yeah. Right? I mean, and for years, that's that was, that was the. And Jake was the same way. You and Jake had so many similarities in that because he was that first, I would say he was the first, like, for me anyway, in my generation, that first really scary, yeah. like he was the mysterious, scary person. 
Yeah, Kevin. I think you know, like Kevin Sullivan tried it a little bit. Yeah, he he flirted with, but he wasn't physically scared. I mean, he was a, yeah. he was a smaller stature guy. I mean, but he was kind of that that sinister type character too. But Jake, Jake just had. I mean, he, he, his body type, his. Everything. He didn't he have just, to do anything over the top because I feel yeah. like Kevin Sullivan a lot of times. I mean, he'd do the he eye makeup yeah. and stuff. Like Jake didn't have to do that. It came really organic. To Jake. Jake could just smile and it felt evil. Yeah, yeah. And it was. <laughs> <laughs> he was awesome. No, honestly, honestly. And he honestly. wasn't physically imposing no, either. No, he was tall. He was Jake was like six five, six six. But, but he, he didn't was, have that build that yeah. you saw in the 80s and, and, and early 90s. He would have took away from him, I think, if, if he would have been really jacked. I think, yeah. Because yeah, I, I, sometimes the body can be a distraction. Um, and it, I think, I mean, he was built perfectly for what he was. And that was, uh, you know, just a sinister guy that could work with anybody. And uh, everything he did, man, everything he did was had a purpose and it, meant something for something later on either in the match or the or the program the whole deal and he was just a wrestling genius this episode is brought to you by prize picks prize picks is the best way to get action on sports in more than 30 states across the country including california texas and florida prize picks is the easiest and most exciting way to turn every game-changing moment into a hundred times your money with as little as four correct picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000. It's the easiest app to use for even a guy like me. Download the app today and use code 6FEET for the first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today and use code 6FEET for a first deposit match up to $100. Why do you think that, God, we could... Yeah, this could turn into a Jake the Snake episode here. Um, why do you think that when people talk about the Mount Rushmores of wrestlers or the greats, the mm -hmm. the top fives, even top tens, right? Why isn't Jake ever put into these categories? Why well, am I never mentioning him? Well, so and this is funny because somebody had asked me this uh, in one of my One Dead Man shows about my Mount Rushmore, which I've you know, I've I've stated many times is Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, and and Stone Cold. That's my Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Those four those four guys are not the greatest wrestlers. No. In, in that ever come down the pike, those guys aren't necessarily the best psychologists. Those four guys are on the Mount my Mount Rushmore because of their contributions to the business. Yeah. What they meant to the business, Andre. Andre was traveling around. Andre was doing, you know, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson long before any other wrestler was. Yeah. Andre was the face of wrestling. He was an attraction all over the world. He made wrestling cool to a, a lot of people who would never be exposed to wrestling. Maybe the first global. Oh, uh, by far. Wrestler. By yeah. far. Yeah, 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 yeah. Andre was friends with everybody. Andre was friends with Ali. He was friends with Schwarzenegger. He was friends. I mean, he had all these people because he was just bigger than life. Um, you know, Hogan, of course, the, that the 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 Hogan in the in the in the late eighties turned wrestling. You know, he was the one there and and Vince's vision to take it on a national stage and was, pretty much made WCW what it was. And I mean, when he turned heel. Obviously, you know, Ric Flair, uh, for, you know, he was, I mean, he's the champ. He is what wrestling. When you think of world champion, you, yeah, think, you of think of Ric Flair. And then Stone Cold. I mean, he's part of the biggest, probably the most, um, I don't know, most popular era ever yeah. in, in wrestling. I mean, we're, we don't know what this era, how where it's going to top out at. I mean, it's growing, but exponentially, but it's not growing like it, like it, like it did when Steve took over. Yeah, right? Stone Cold said, "No, on another level." Right, a, a whole other level. Yeah. So that's that's how I come up with my Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Because people always ask me, "You love Shawn Michaels working with Shawn Michaels?" Well, you never saw me say, "Oh, Shawn Michaels." Shawn Michaels was great. There's nobody in the ring better than Shawn Michaels. But Shawn Michaels didn't have as big a 
influence on the industry as a yeah, whole. And the impact. And impact. Yeah. Same with Bret Hart. Bret Hart in the ring. I mean, nobody better than Bret Hart in the ring. <laughs> but it, it, it's just what your impact on the industry. That's how I come up with mine. And that's why. And I think that's the same with, with Jake. Uh, you know, if you give if you narrow my Mount Rushmore down, like give me the Mount Rushmore of heels or something like that. Yeah, he's then you you you're gonna put you know you're gonna put a Jake the Snake in there or just certain you you just need to be a little more specific. But if you go to Mount Rushmore, you know that's that's my that's the way I think about it. Like yeah, it's, it's it's not skill or or what you can do in the ring. It's what your your influence over the whole industry was. So, but I mean, my goodness, there Jake. Jake could work with anybody. Everything Jake did made sense. And you sure didn't want that Python getting dropped on you at the end of the night. I mean, it's just so, it's so cool. He was cool. He was. Yeah. And I was always a heel guy. I loved heels. Even as a kid, you know, I just, I enjoyed, I was a Four Horsemen fan. You know, there wasn't very many kids in my school growing up that were. Right. A four, you know, they were pro four horsemen. Their dads were, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, yeah, yeah. they were all they were all dusty. Yeah, they, all dusty they, they loved dusty, or they loved Hogan. They loved right. Warrior. They, you know, right. Um, and I was the I loved the four horsemen. I loved Jake the Snake. I loved the heels. And when, I mean, the the snake bite on Saturday morning, you know, on on oh, yeah. on Macho and what that did for the the sport itself was yeah. unreal. Yeah, that that caught national news. Yeah. yeah, when we didn't get national news unless somebody had passed away or something. I mean, it was that he, was yeah, that he, was special. He just did he just did things to where what the program he worked with Macho to be able to make it where the fans loved Macho Man so much. And loved Elizabeth so much because they hated Jake so much. Yeah. And he had that type of effect. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and he was he he was gasoline to fire. Like Mach was already, Mach was already what one or two top three biggest stars in the industry, and then you you have Jake. I mean, it's just like oh, there's there's a fire. Oh, let me throw some gas on that and just Gosh. watch it all blow up. And and that that's that's how, what that's what Jake brought to the table. He was, you know, I mean, he had, I mean, he had a great, man, he had a great feud with, uh, with Rick Rude. And, no, I'm sorry, Rick Rude and him as Jake as a baby face, even like even defending his wife. Yeah. I mean, he, even as a baby face, he was still sinister and like had that, that he had that air about him. Like, yeah, he would probably curb stomp you if you given the opportunity. Yeah. Right. I mean, he was just so good. And I, um, uh, I do wish that uh, maybe some of the outside of the the ring influences wouldn't have consumed him as much, so that we could have gotten more, yeah, good quality years out of him. Oh, yeah. in the in the ring, yeah, it, it, you know, it was I was you know there for a lot of that and, and and the and his decline, and it's really sad because like if I knew if I knew then what I know now, yeah, like maybe you know I don't know that I I mean man when you get the monkey on your back that hard, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It does become difficult, um, but man, he, he he seems to be doing good now. Oh yeah. And uh, but it would have been nice to have a few more years of of prime Jake yeah. the Snake. But and I don't know how much influence he still has with the other program, or if he's still working with any of those guys or anything. But if anyone is working under Jake the Snake, there they're lucky to have him as a as a mentor. If there is, if there's a guy, if there's a guy. <laughs> that's looking for advice on how to be a, a top tier heel and has Jake's ear. Yeah. I would wear, I would wear Jake out at this point, you know, just, you know, his brain. If I'm Logan Paul, I'm calling up Jake. Yeah. Cause I'm putting you on the plane. I'm yeah. going to you down and let me, let me, let me, yeah, just let me I'm, sit under your learning tree for a little bit. I'm going to take some of that energy drink money and we're going to, uh, yeah, we're going to put you on the G five and, <laughs> Come on down here. We're gonna we're gonna talk wrestling. Cause he can, God, he can do it with the best of I mean, His promos, I mean, money, yeah, money, and it, and it, it works in any era. Yeah. 
he works today as well as he did oh, easy. then. Yeah. And that's what makes guys like – that's where, for me, I'm not saying he's a Mount Rushmore guy, but if he's not in the conversation of top ten, just like overall just guys that yeah. could do it, on the stick, in the ring, everything. Like, the story, the storytelling, maybe just, you might put him on that Mount Rushmore of storytellers. storytellers. I think he is on the Mount Rushmore of storytelling. Yeah. 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 His, his, his storytelling, everything he did was for the story and made sense. He was, the, he was a prime example. What did he do? He did a short arm clothesline and a DDT. Yeah. That was Jake's, that was Jake's offense. You know what else he did? He sold him. He put you over. That's his whole thing. He would put you put over. You over. Don't get hit with the DDT. Watch the short arm clothesline. <laughs> and people terrified of him. He was so legit. Yeah. yeah. It was so good, man. He was so, so good. We're lucky to uh, have been able to watch him. Oh, man, and was, you were lucky to be able to work yeah, with him. I was lucky to be able in the car and, and ride with him <laughs> certain nights. <laughs> uh, you know. But, no, I, I wouldn't trade any of it. I mean, I, oh, I, could. I, I wouldn't trade any of it. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I learned so much from, from him. Uh, man, it was a, a good and bad. I mean. There are certain people that I would love more than anything to just sit over there in the corner and have sitting across from you in a setting like this. And he's one of them. Oh, man. I would, I would, I would kill for that just because. Yeah, uh, me, you'd be over there. You would be, you'd be jumping up and down. Like, oh, I would. Yeah! Well, I'm I'm such a fan of his yeah. to start with, but then yeah. it, it I I love storytellers and I love uh, the wrestlers that could really tell a story. He is definitely on that Mount Rushmore, but I also know how much of a contribution he was for you, oh. and I know how much he meant to you. You know how much he means yeah. to you, yeah. and uh, yeah, he he's definitely somebody that uh, I just think is amazing. So great question. Uh, was, you know, we could do a Jake the Snake episode in a in a heartbeat. Like <laughs> easy. <laughs> so um, our next question uh, comes from uh, David Martinez. I'm able to I'm able to actually pronounce this name here. Uh, he says uh, that he is from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn is a popular place these days. Uh, the very first live show I got to uh, see you at was Madison Square Garden. I was a kid and was absolutely stoked as I watched you face against nails. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh Kevin <laughs> Kelly. Thank you so much for the memories. My question is, uh, when would you, um, when you would come to New York, would you guys enjoy the city for a few days or were you just so busy uh, that you only flew in and out real quick? I asked because I don't hear a lot of stories of Undertaker sightings uh, at the Brooklyn Bridge, Times Square, or public places <laughs> in New York. <laughs> yeah, man. I, so here's the thing, right? Yeah, you didn't see me a lot. No, I, we, so we, we normally, we stayed in um, uh, Newark, New Jersey, right there by the Newark airport. Yeah. Because that's where it was more convenient most times to fly in and out of Newark. Um, and uh, so we would go and obviously get right out. So the at Madison Square Garden, back in the day, they used to have parking right across the street. And this is before we had security or anything else. So you had to make your way from that parking garage across the street and through the back door. And there would legit be a thousand plus people oh. in there that you had to walk through and try through and, the parking garage, through the parking garage, across the street, all the way oh, to the back geez. doors of Madison square garden. It was a nightmare. I mean, it was a legit nightmare. And, you know, right in that, that early nineties era there, when I turned baby face, good Lord. I mean, it was bizarre. You know, Paul and I would roll up and, it was just like, we can't do this. We can't, there's, there's, just, there's no way that we're going to be able to make it through this, this group of people. And I, so what, 
what we ended up doing somehow or another, I don't remember, I think it might have been Pat Patterson that told me about this. So what we started doing, there was a, like there was this Ramada hotel in downtown New York. And in their parking garage, they had like a, like a little space like that you could stand in to get out of the cold uh, while the, somebody either went got, you know, valet got your car. Yeah. So we would start parking. We would start parking, I don't know, wait, six blocks away. And then we'd have the ambulance at the, from the garden come pick us up. We'd get in the back of the ambulance. The ambulance would go into the garden. The doors would shut. Then we we would get out. And we did this. I mean, I bet we did that three years. It's perfect. Man, we get in, we get out, miss all the traffic. Somehow or another, it got out. That y'all were... Yeah, that, that that's how we were doing it. So one day, we're, you know, we're talking about uh, we're talking about going out to eat back in, you know, we're go- or what we were going to do, whatever. Hotel, I mean, the, the ambulance is on the way to the Ramada. We get, the ambulance stops. We open the back doors of this ambulance, and there's about 1,200 people. Somebody, they had figured it out. And both of you were just sitting there. We were just sitting there with the doors open to the back of this ambulance, and there's just an ocean. There's just an ocean of people <laughs> standing there. And y'all have no idea. We had no clue. Like, we were not expecting that. So now we still, you know, it's usually like a 15, 20 minute wait to get your car because it had to be valeted, right? So we're just standing in this open area. Oh, my God. And there are, uh, <laughs> there's just like, we're like, we're like fish in an aquarium and there's just this oh. ocean of people. So uh, I think it was shortly thereafter that I finally, I was like, you know what? When we go into the city from now on, or we go out to Long Island, or whatever we're going to do, I said, we're going to car service. Yeah. They're going to take us right in and right out. Like back then, you, we were so cheap. Like <laughs> we, it was just the wrestler mentality. Yeah. You know, it was like, we can't spend that kind of money. We got to save our money. We got to do this. But yeah, you know, it, it's all a write off. And sometimes you had to spend money just out of, to yeah. be sane. And, and, uh, but yeah, so after that, we started getting a, Anytime we were in New York or Long Island or something like that, we'd have to use a car service. Yeah. This is from Victor Gomez. He says, uh, Dear Mark, thank you for all your years of entertainment and greatness these last 30 plus years. And thank you for helping through tough times as I was growing up. My question is about Buried Alive in Your House 1996. How was the idea brought up to you and Mick? What went into putting that match together? Thank you again. Well, and by 96, I mean, my goodness, we'd already done so much to each other. So we had to keep <laughs> trying to come up with something, um, you know, something to just up the ante that much more. Um, I, honestly, like, I don't remember... I don't remember whose idea it was for Buried Alive. May have been Mix. I'm not even sure. Um, Sounds like a Mick thing. It does sound like a Mick <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. Anything that 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 will maim or <laughs> cripple Mick, he's always always all in there. But we needed something to up the ante just a little bit more as far as that feud was going because we had had so many different kind of gimmick matches and just we'd running out of ways to abuse each other and um, looking for obviously a, a way um, you know a, a way to kind of make it an, an end to the match or an end to the feud um, so I mean what what more can you do to one human being than bury them alive <laughs> you, you know unfortunately I mean, I won that match, but I ended up being the one that actually got buried alive. Oh, yeah. Um, and it was a, uh, you know, that was an opportunity, again, for me to go away for a little bit and then come back with a, you know, a little bit of a change to the character 
and, and move in to, to different angles with different guys. Um, but uh, I was on board right away with the concept. I mean, it was like, I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but what a visual. Um, and even to this day, it's such an iconic visual of that purple glove come popping up out of, or was it gray? I don't remember if it was, it, you know, this was, yeah, I went to, I went to purple in 94. So yeah, it was the purple glove coming yeah. up through the dirt. And, uh, you know, I, I, that was such a, a, a cool thing for, especially for the time period. Yeah. We were, we were pretty innovative for the stuff that we were doing, but, uh, you know, everybody was like a gasp in the, in the, in the audience like oh my he's gone you can't see anything but dirt he's buried yeah right and then the next thing you know there it comes that hand just to, just enough to let him know that i may be out but i ain't out for long yeah and uh really cool stuff man it was it, it, it was it was it was fun i don't know that i ever i have to look back but i won that match i don't think i ever won another buried alive <laughs> I, I lost. I lost to. Uh, I lost to Steve. I lost to Vince. Um, yeah, I didn't. My 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 record in in my own matches <laughs> weren't the greatest. Casket matches I did pretty good in, but buried alive, not so much. Um, you get asked a lot about like how, you know. How were y'all? How did y'all do that and all that stuff? I mean, like you've had it the one dead man shows. People asked about it. Yeah. Like, um, you know, how were you under the ground? I mean, I was at uh, I think it was in Pittsburgh. Someone asked that in part of your Q and A, and I think they even said something about, you know, on Bruce Pritchard's uh, podcast, he wouldn't reveal it, and you right. were like, well, if he's not going to reveal it, well, I wasn't going to reveal it either way. <laughs> no. Like, but I think that. Uh, it's still one of those mysteries, right? That even in this day, even and age, this day and age, yeah, yeah. There's just certain things that should remain a mystery on how it's done. I don't, you know, Harry Houdini, yeah. you knew it was an illusion, but you didn't. He didn't tell you how you did it. No. Right? So, uh, if man, if I can hold on just to that little, little bit, and just a little okay, fabe, and 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 not give just everything away, I, I'll, I'll be all right. Um, I think that's uh, you know. Your run with Mick, though, maybe is some of my favorite stuff to watch. Um, it was just so violent, uh, it, you know, for the for the time period and, and what they had seen up to that point. I mean, the violence that 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 we projected on each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it there. There wasn't anything really that matched that. I almost feel like ECW built an entire organization off of <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean they would take you to a, 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 a another level but yeah with, I think with Mick and I everything that we did because of our characters it all made sense yeah right you would expect us to be in a boiler room brawl because of, of his character yeah you would expect a buried alive you would expect a body bag or you know all that it just all made sense to what you know, where we were at in our in our story and what we were doing, uh, I think a lot of times nowadays, I mean, you can you can sit and scroll through, uh, you know, you can scroll through social media and all these wrestling sites, and there there's just there's certainly smaller like you know independent outlaw promotions are just doing violence to to be violent. To, yeah, to, it, it's almost like um, uh, it's like a like gore movies kind of it's just how graphic can you be and it's and it's not for without really any technique without a story without yeah without anything that makes any sense it's just the sake of okay i'm gonna go through a table or i'm gonna get hit with a light bulb just for the sake of getting rid of a light bulb which you know i'm not opposed to to that but it has to make sense and it has to it has to be wrapped around a story that makes sense yeah. you just don't you don't go to that level um, just for the sake of going to that level. And, um, you know, obviously you're not going to see that kind of stuff with WWE anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, that's all family. Yeah. That's or... off the, that, that's off the charts, uh, or, you know, off the table as far as what they can do. And I don't, I mean, they're not missing a beat. Is Mick the only wrestler that you feel like could have 
um, had those types of matches with The Undertaker? Do you feel like <clears throat> he's the only one that could have pulled Undertaker into a match that had that type of violence, like him, Kane? Kane. Kane. Me, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't. I mean, let me think. I mean, I'd have to go back through the, the roller decks of everybody that I worked with, but I mean, those two. Those two stand where out. it makes sense. It makes sense that you would have a uh, an infernal match because yeah, you know he was burned up as a child. It, so that it, all those crazy matches all had a like you and Kane were like two people that you can't be killed. You know what right, I'm saying? Yeah. So like you have to go to the extremes against each other mm -hmm. for one person to come out victor. Right. Right. With Mick, it's. Mick's got to take the for Mick to beat an Undertaker. Yeah, it's got to be yeah, it's extreme. Gotta, yeah, it's got to go to the next level. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's what makes it believable. Yeah, right. He's with with Mick, with Mick and mankind. I always you, my image and my my understanding of it is like I will do this to myself just so that I can do this to you. Yeah. Right. That was, that was mixed ment mentality, right? That was the story that he was telling. I'm going to endure this much pain, which is going to be, you know, it's going to be monumental pain just to inflict a little bit of pain on you. I'm willing but, to go through hell yeah, just to get yeah. you to have a little bit of a sunburn. Exactly. And yeah. when it, so when you start thinking about that kind of mindset, like, how deranged the individual does he have to be to 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 to, to do those kind of things? You know, you'd said his, you know, I would wear him out, and then he would get on the apron and take a stick or a pencil and jab it into his leg, and and you know, he'd pull his hair out. I mean, that's this next level commitment, but it all made sense into his tormented mindset that he yeah. had, and that's why it made it so believable. And then, you know, and then you have this indestructible force called the Undertaker. Like, this guy's going to, this guy will kill himself. This guy will torture himself to torture this person. And I think that's what makes Mick so interesting is the fact of, we've talked about, you know, thinking outside the box and, you know, just mm -hmm. stretching those boundaries and doing different things. And You've mentioned Bray Wyatt before, and I just look at like Mick, and Mick was that guy. I think a lot of people look at Mick and think of the extreme stuff of the, you know, thumbtacks and and, right. and 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 just staples and crazy crap like that. But I think he, I mean, what he was able to do in the ring of storytelling, and it maybe physically and athletically he wasn't on the same level as a lot of folks, right. but what he could what he made up for through storytelling, I think is what makes him so special. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it just, yeah. His commitment to taking the tools that he had and he didn't just take thumbtacks just to take thumbtacks. Yeah. No. It's just, that's the, that's the difference between uh, what you see a lot of now is people do things just for the shock <laughs> the, of doing it. He lands on the thumbtacks and then rolls it. Yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> he uh that and but those are the things about him that once again if you just if you're a young wrestler man you want to attach yourself to a guy like a jake the snake or a, a mick foley like you don't necessarily want to do those things but you want to understand why like he did those things yeah right that's what that's that's the that's the the element it's like why would you do that? Why did you do that when you did that there? And it, and it and it was it was all it was all it all revolved around story. Was there people in the locker room that didn't want to maybe work with Mick because of some of the extreme stuff he would do in the ring? Were they a little nervous to potentially work with him? Um, I don't I don't remember anybody because Mick most of the time hurt himself. It wasn't necessarily you. It was wasn't gonna, necessarily you weren't going to necessarily get thumbtacks. No, but. no, 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 no. I mean, I got, I got thumbtacks. You know, after our initial, let me, let me think here. Like one of the roughest 
uh, things that I remember taking from Mick was the night that Mick debuted. It was right after, uh, I wonder what was it, WrestleMania? It was WrestleMania in LA. I don't actually remember what number. I, I had worked with uh, Diesel. Okay. Diesel was about to go on to uh, WCW. I'm worked the next night on Raw. Uh, I worked with, I believe I worked with, uh, I think I did, I did a TV match with JBL. I worked with Vader. And then I think uh, Mick debuted. And I the biggest thing that he did that probably hurt more than anything else that Mick ever did to me is he ended up, you know, slamming me or running me into the steps and dropping the elbow off of the apron onto the concrete. Yeah. And I mean, that was, that was pretty snug, but when you look, when, when, yeah, when you look back to this whole thing of this, this, of the angle, um, he, he took a lot more, you know, he took a lot more than he dished out. And, uh, yeah, man, he was, he, he's special, man. He really, he, he really is. Yeah. And, um, uh, there's a there's a there's this weird Mount Rushmore over here that he lives on of <laughs> what you're willing to do to yourself for the sake of your your fans and it, it, it's it's so like yeah I think people are, are nowadays I, I think they're used to it now but when I finally started talking you know like oh well he doesn't you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. he actually is a human being. To to know the human being that Mick is, yeah. like the kind-hearted soul, like <laughs> you just it's hard to it's hard to look back into mankind and see, okay, this guy is actually this guy who is Santa Claus every year. Could you imagine being like his grandkids or something? And you look back and you watch these old matches and like, stuff. Okay, and honey, like... <laughs> you're going to stay with grandpa. Grandpa, was it grandpa a wrestler? Oh, oh yeah. Well, let's watch this. <laughs> I don't want to stay with grandpa. I could, I could see him babysitting the kids and all of a sudden, you know, Parents come to pick up the kids, and the kids can't sleep at night. <laughs> the kids can't sleep at night. They got big patches cut out of their hair where they wanted to be. Like, they're, they're in their room wrestling. They've got tacks on the oh, ground. Yeah. Like, oh, That's what granddaddy did. Yeah, yeah. That was good. <laughs> we watched all of his stuff. Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, that's good. Nick is... Um, that's funny. Man, he's a treat. He's a national treasure. Oh, he is. No <laughs> doubt about that. All right, so we've got um, Ty Stockton. Ty Stockton. Ty Stockton. Sounds like a bull rider. Ty Hurden. Wasn't he a bull rider? Yep. Something like that. Yeah. Um, hey, Mark. I'm absolutely loving the podcast. Matt's Which the one? best part of it. <laughs> oh, ours. Oh, I need that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Oh, Appreciate thanks, it. Ty. Thank you. Um, this Ty, is a, Ty Heaterman. Ty is it Ty Heaterman? That's is it Ty Heaterman, the bull rider. I think so. Somebody like digress. That. Get back. Yeah. Get to Ty Stockton. Um, my question is, did he really say that about the podcast? He said that he enjoys the podcast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's been nice to hear a different side of the phenom or taker. Before I ask this question, I don't know if I've told you this or not. A lot of people have not liked the fact that I call you Mark. You should call me Taker. Or, or like Undertaker. Or, yeah. Really? Yeah. And I'm like, I think here's the problem. I don't know you as the Undertaker. I never... Yeah, I will. It, it, like, you, call, like, if we're in public or something, I may say Taker or something like that. But for the most part, I just, you're Mark. And naturally, I just, I call you Mark. I don't naturally call you Undertaker. Right. And uh, I might, well, we had to get back to that, like Mr. Undertaker. Is that how you want me to refer to you? <laughs> Let's just try it. Let's just try it. To see if it Mr. Works. Dead Man, Mr. Undertaker, Ty Stockton. I'd like to know. I don't, it may not work, but let's just let's, let's, let's see what it sounds like. Okay, yeah. all right, we're gonna start from the top. All right, Mr. Undertaker. Yes, Matt. 
Uh, I just didn't like the way that felt. Didn't feel good. Did nope. It? No. Nope. All right. All right, Marky. All right. So, uh, Ty, big, big daddy. It's going to be big daddy. Ty Stockton wants to know. Uh, I think this is a pretty good question to wrap this one up. What is the biggest mistake a green, quotes, rookie can make getting into the business? What's the biggest mistake a rookie can make when trying to get into the professional wrestling business? Uh, Man, there's so many. Uh, how do you how do you categorize? Uh, there's so many rookie mistakes. Um, not respecting the guys that have been there in the trenches doing it is a big mistake. Okay. Um, thinking you know more than you actually do is a big mistake. Um, being entitled. Uh, Man, there's I mean, there's a laundry list of of big mistakes rookies make, um, and and, and two. Not this is where it gets a little you know it, it it becomes a fine line, of rookies not being able to speak up at all, and getting walked over. But in my generation. Back in my day. Oh, back in my day. I can't believe I just said that. Oh, I hope this made me 75 and not alive. Anyway, <laughs> but like uh, there would be a lot of times where guys would try, you know, veterans would try and take advantage of you. I could see that. Especially if you showed any kind of potential whatsoever. <laughs> they want to bury you as soon as possible. <laughs> that was kind of a generational thing. I think today... Uh, I, I don't think it, that is, as um, you know, as, as common as it was when, when I come up, Yeah, I think people are more willing to help you and, and make you, you know, give you a little bit, but, um, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just really big. I'm really big on, on respect and, and listening and, and, uh, kind of just figuring that kind of part out, like. Okay, I'm the greenhorn. You know, this guy's, you know, he's made it. He's been here. He's done it. You know, let me let me shut up and listen. If I have a question, then respectfully address that question, and not say, oh, I don't think that's going to work for me. Yeah, and I think you might get future endeavored really quick that way. So uh, be respectful, and and again, it always comes back to this, man. Never ever be content. I always come back to that. That's your favorite. It it, quote. it 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 is because some people think just because somebody might give you a free cup of coffee at the Waffle House doesn't make you a star. No. And if that's what you're working for, man, you're wasting your time. It's just a hard life, and it, it, it's there's so many more levels to get to, and and just um, yeah. Once you become content, you stop growing, and once you stop growing. You're done, pretty much. Uh, you know, you have to continual, continually evolve and 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 make that make your character expand and give levels to it all. Um, I know I'm kind of getting away from from the rookie thing, but uh, you know, respect, not being content, and uh, and also being in a respectful manner, being able to to speak up for yourself. Yeah. And I think the, you know, not being content thing, um, we've, we've discussed the rock, uh, previously, but you had the same experience when you came out to NXT a few months back where you know that you haven't been content. You know that you've put in the work whenever you can roll out like you did at NXT or like the rock on SmackDown coming back where your pop is bigger than anybody else's pop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that night, and you hadn't been in the ring in a while. That's that's equity. That's equity. <laughs> you you've done something right, and it but it takes yeah. time to get there. Yeah. And just because you got one pop one time, mm -mm. don't mean they don't mean Jack. No. No. I, I I've seen a lot of people that are going to be the next big thing out the door quicker than they came in. Yeah. Yeah. 
And uh, I think like when it comes to being a rookie and, and, and anything, because you hear the same thing no matter what it is. So like what, no matter what the sport is, right. the job, whatever, learn from your peers, learn from the people around you, learn from the people that have done it before you, learn sit back and mistakes. watch, be the last person to talk, you know, just uh, just observe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, what was the dumbest thing you did as a rookie? Uh Gosh, that had to be that have to be Bruiser Brody, <laughs> very first match. <laughs> yeah. I mean that that's just yeah. You know, I tell this story in my in in, in my one Dead Man show sometimes. Uh, you know, I I don't know. I just lost my mind <laughs> because I am I like it's, I I am I was so respectful to people. I, I I went for months without saying anything to anybody who ever walked into the sportatorium, just trying to get noticed. And then all of a sudden, I take one of the dudes with the baddest reputations in all of professional wrestling, and I decide in my first match, because I feel like I'm bigger than he is, I'm going to call my own spot. And a real tough guy, too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm talking about a legit tough guy. Yeah. I learned real quick. Like, yeah. You got to earn those stripes. You got to earn, yeah. I had... I was I was years away from opening my mouth, <laughs> and it was probably a good long time before I opened my mouth again. To be honest, as far as putting some together or or, or, or thinking on the fly like that, uh, I, I think I don't think he had any idea how green I was. Okay, uh, Brody yeah. coming in, he was just coming in. Uh, that was his first match back. He had no clue how green I was. But I think he appreciated the fact that, like, I had the gumption to, yeah, to call something. I don't know, like, if he had known that it was my very first match <laughs> that I was trying to call <laughs> my old spot. He may have decapitated me. Uh, but um, yeah, it was. Well, that lack of knowledge may have saved your life. So, yeah, yeah, because he was an advocate for me after the afterwards. He, yeah, he, you know, he was like, "Hey, man, you guys need to keep this kid and get rid of some of these." <laughs> some of these old timers around here and I'm like, okay, that's not kind of what I need to hear around all these guys that I've got to get, I got to go in the dressing room and change with. Uh, well, uh, yeah, just don't be stupid as a rookie. Yeah, don't, don't be stupid. Yeah. yeah. Don't, 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 don't believe your own hype. Just kind of, you know, be humble. And like, like you said, observe, learn, your time will come if you if it's meant to be. Yeah. But don't don't think you know everything because you've watched something. It there just you go. don't work that way. <laughs> well, um, we love getting questions from our our fans, and uh, you know th this is it always makes uh, these podcasts more fun and easier for us because a lot yeah. of times I, I you know. Once again, I just know Mark Callaway. I could. Well, you, I want to see her talk football and and rest and uh and hunting. You know, that's what yeah. I want to talk about yeah. uh, more than anything. But I know our fans want uh, to hear some good old wrestling stories. Some good right? wrestling content. Yes. So we appreciate uh, everyone submitting questions. If you'd like to submit a question, all you have to do is go over to Patreon, look up Six Feet Under with Mark Calloway, and uh, be patient. Be patient. There, there are quite a few questions. There are quite a few questions. And we'll get to them. Is this? It yeah, takes a while. It takes though. a minute. But it, it takes a long minute. Um, Mark, let's get out of here and uh, maybe put a little food in our belly. That sounds like a great idea. You got any ideas? <laughs>